Jack uh, and Richard already mentioned, you know, this, this goal of uh, eradicating extreme poverty is sort of what's concentrating people's minds at the moment. The interesting thing is sort of whether or not we're going to be able to move this sort of huge mass of people who are in unskilled, insecure, itinerant, unremunerative uh, occupations into something more stable and secure. I think it's fair to say that um, certainly in Bangladesh and certainly in India, and certainly in much of South Asia, but for, for much of the world, labor is the main endowment of the poor, it's the people who are essentially capitalists. And so, not surprisingly, labor markets and poverty are very tightly linked. So what we're, what we're sort of pushing at is that if we're going to think about transforming the economic lives of the poor, we have to think about uh, occupational change. And I think it's fair to say that occupational change is not going to come just from straight transfers. Because to have a change in occupation, you have to hit like either one of the margins, like access to capital or access to human capital. Obviously, many of us are wage workers in the sense that we're not going to go to the capital. But the point is, if you're at the very bottom, if you're illiterate and so forth, then changing occupation is not something that's typically achieved by a transfer, you know, as, as Mushtaq put a dole. Uh, so I think actually a lot of the evolution and the things you talked to Mushtaq yesterday in, in the ultra poor thing came from realizing we just didn't want to engage in give, giveaways. We wanted to add something uh, to that uh, giveaway so that the people after the program were changed in terms of their occupational capacities relative to before the program. It's also interesting that there is, when you begin to look at some statistics from India, just how prevalent the sort of casual labor uh, category is in terms of employment, particularly in, in rural areas, and certainly not limited to rural areas, because casual labor is also a very dominant form of employment in, uh, in urban areas. And so how I ca characterize these people, they're sort of the bottom of what you might call the employment ladder, and they're people who basically have been left behind by modern economic growth. So one of the reasons, actually, interesting, I got interested in the Ultra Poor program was that back in 2006, I'd been working, with, uh, I had a PhD student working with Mushtaq on the informal schools, a Thai student, and then I met uh, Imran Matin here, who was uh, then the director of research, and he said there's this program going on. So I went out to the northwest of Bangladesh, and that's the 2006, so there were some women who were four years in, some that were two years in, in this pilot. And I kind of asked to talk to these women. And I was sort of interested in a couple of things. One was, were they doing anything beyond the asset that had been transferred, which was typically livestock? And I got some sense that they were doing stuff like buying a renting paddy land. They were uh, buying rickshaws, which they rented out. So it seemed like they were sort of in a different state uh, than, than relative to, to places where there ha hadn't been the program. And the second thing I was interested in is sort of, was there a sense that they were you know, more confident, they felt different? And you could, you know, when somebody like me shows up in a Bangladesh village, everybody shows up to see this strange person. And so you could sort of tell the way they sort of stood with the landowners and the sort of elites and so forth, that they were in a sort of different space than uh, people who hadn't gone. And that's what got me interested. And then I think it took roughly a year to convince Brack uh, that doing a randomized control trial was a good idea. And so the, the, the timeline is 2007, we do the baseline. 2009, we do this two-year follow-up. 2011, we do the four-year follow-up. And then 2014, we do the seven-year follow-up, which Oriana will talk about this afternoon. But I think it's fair to say that you know, the sentiment that Richard was expressing, which that was, is, sure, we can just leave these people alone. You know, they, they can stay where they are, doing the things they, they're doing. Or we, or we can't. I mean, th there's a sense that the, uh, so to give you a few statistics, it's about 93% of the population who are working with are illiterate. Median age is 40, uh, all have children. So these are not a population that are going to be moving to the garment factories in, in, in Dhaka. These are largely a captive population. And the picture I want to build up is that in, in the villages in which they live, there's a very limited set of things that anybody does, never mind the poor. There's a very limited set of occupations. And those three occupations are ag labor, working as a domestic servant, or working, this is for women, uh, or working, a rearing, what we might call large livestock, so cows and, uh, 
uh, and uh, goats. That's 80% of the hours that the women of any uh, wealth class in the villages. So, you know, the, 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 after this, for the ultra poor, the next category is begging. Okay, so this is a very poor, you know, they basically have very limited human capital, they have no assets. So what's really interesting here is it's sort of an experiment, can we do anything with this very captive, very uh, disadvantaged uh, group? And that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, today. So you might sort of characterize the, the sort of employment ladder with casual laborers at the bottom and then what people call sort of subsistence entrepreneurs or family enterprises, and then going into some of the stuff that starts to happen in, uh, in, in peri-urban cities and so forth. Uh, and then the sort of top. So obviously we'd like people to sort of shift into this category, but you know, we have to be realistic. So I'm going to be focusing mainly on this, you know, what you might call the bottom of the ladder, but what I'm going to sort of be arguing that even movements in the bottom of the ladder can have quite, uh, quite significant uh, effects. So one, just a couple of things which uh, kind of motivated me and others to come into this is it's a strong sense this is a really big group. It's not a small group of people. The second is they're very vulnerable. This has come across multiple times. You know, if, you're, if your income is W over P, uh, then any interruption in, in making W is bad. For example, the weather is bad or there's seasonal demand and so forth. And any, any uh, price increase is bad because you're a net consumer of food. So for example, if there's uh, drought or something, uh, then price has got more. And there's even a, tr you know, a traditional trend in that direction in the northwest of Bangladesh, which is known as sort of the Monga region, which translates to famine. So independently of this work, I've been doing some work with Dave Donaldson in India on the sort of role of the railroads in, in mitigating uh, climate shocks and effects on mortality. And what I realized when you look at famine mortality in British India, this is the group that's dying. It's the agricultural workers, and it's basically because they get thrown out of employment when there is uh, drought. So I sort of, the connection where I suddenly thought, hey, these people are still here. They're in, you know, they're in these villages in Bangladesh, and probably their parents and their grandparents were often in these occupations. So can we do anything about this very kind of hard to reach disadvantaged group? And I guess the final motivation was simply that when you think about it, there's no real reason to feel that the, in terms of innate talent, that the poor should be, have less talent than the, than the non-poor. So they seem like there's a kind of a misallocation of talent. The people who may be quite able to do things are not able to do that because they don't have the necessary inputs of capital or human capital. So I'm going to just give you very quickly the, the, um, the main results from the evaluation. I've given you the timeline. Uh, Mushtaq has talked through the content of the program. So it's a multifaceted, trying to hit multiple constraints type of program. This is just a picture of uh, the um, different branches we're looking at. Just to point out that the majority of the people are in these uh, casual labor, and often in more so in one of either uh, casual wage labor, in agriculture, or domestic made. And then there's uh, uh, the, the, the remainder of employment is relatively relatively And returns, again looking, uh, arraying it by uh, returns to livestock, are typically higher in the majority of the, the, the areas covered by these BRAC uh, offices in livestock rearing, what we might call live livestock rearing in cows and goats. So this, and, and this is also interesting, these are very, very flat. So it looks like for, you know, the wage for ag labor and the wage for Domestic servant is, is, is sort of fairly common across uh, different uh, different parts of Bangladesh. Now this is really interesting. So here we begin to sort of get into what people do. So, the, so, so just to give you the setup here, we we choose twenty the, the spots or villages covered by uh, twenty BRAC offices as treatment, and then we choose the spots or villages covered by another twenty offices as uh, control. That in both those sets of villages, we go through the identification procedure. Well, the community goes through the identification procedure by saying who is the ultra poor, who is the near poor, who is the middle, and who is the rich. So there's common identification, and then BRAC cross checks it against a set of guidelines. So we know that the populations defined in treatment and control are similar. And so what I'm showing you here has nothing to do with the, the program itself. It's just in 2007. 
Let's open the black box of what labor markets look like in rural Bangladesh. And this is what they look like. So basically, for the ultra poor, which are the people who are going to be given the offer of the program, you can see that the bulk of their uh, hours, the share of their hours, are going to this uh, domestic maid and agricultural labor. And then you, as you move across the wealth distribution, and that's similar for the near poor, you see that basically the rich, the, the middle of the rich, do not engage in wage labor. They're they're, these are for women, primarily engaged in, uh, in livestock rearing. So there's a basically a move from wage labor to self-employment. So very much at the bottom of the employment ladder I showed. And what's interesting is there isn't like, uh, they said begging's the next thing here. You look at the other things they're doing, they're all sort of quite basic uh, forms of employment. So the question then is, one view of this might be, well, the poor are different from the non-poor in some way. Maybe they're, uh, they're not as able, they're not as talented, they may have some behavioral problems, self-control problems. And so what we want to do is say, well, let's relax the constraints on capital and human capital and see if we can shift some of their hours into self-employment. So the program has already been discuss discussed by Mushai, so I won't re repeat that. But the basic idea here is that if you have no productive assets, right, you can only do casual jobs. These are uh, low pay and low demand. So one really fascinating fact from the, from the baseline is that the poor woman, the ultra poor woman, work many, many fewer days in the year than the middle and the rich woman, which seems strange. You know, they're dirt poor. Why aren't they working as much? And it's precisely because there's only seasonal demand for the type of labor and so what basically uh, happens is you can only do that, you can only get that work. So, so take agricultural labor. It's a spot market, right? Somebody has to demand a day of your time in order to have that employment. If they don't demand a day of your time to work on something in agriculture, you don't get that wage for that day. Um, and so you have low pay, low demand, you have low incomes, you can't afford assets, and so the whole thing sort of uh, continues around. The TUP program basically tries to target uh, this problem, and I've given you the characteristics of the, uh, the women targeting. Now, in sort of d dollar terms, roughly half of the cost of the program is the assets, so typically some cow goat combination, and the other half is uh, this sort of initial training, but then this very expensive bit, which are these weekly visits for two years. To, to the target household to look at financial accounts, to, to encourage them you know, that they can do this, to deal with any problems they have with the, with the business and so forth. So it's a very, these are sort of a group which is receiving no attention, you know, by definition from either the government or microfinance, suddenly being lavished with all this support, right? It's a very, very big push, but the interesting thing, and they have the, 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 the food subsidy and so forth, but it all finishes after two years. So we're going to be looking at a point where it's finishing, where it's two years already out and then seven years out. So let's just look at the, the basic results. So the first sort of basic result is you get a massive increase in hours devoted to livestock rearing. So behind this is also the finding that for the majority of households, they just didn't, they didn't get rid of the, the asset that was transferred. So you might imagine if they were unable, you know, to do this business, then they would just sell the asset and, and, and use the proceeds for something else, either consumption or some other, you know, invest in something else, which is something that everyone is going to get at. But actually, they, they mainly retain the asset with this huge increase in the hours work per year. And what this basically does is completely close the gap between the ultra poor and the middle and the rich. So now they're basically working two months more uh, during the year. So basically, in that time, and there's low demand. So it's not like they, they do drop a little bit of uh, uh, time to um, maid work and even less. They're holding on to most of those hours in maid work and agricultural labor, but they're expanding labor supply, which you can see in the final uh, column here, and that's leading to a huge increase in their earnings, so about a 37% increase in their earnings. So it's really that they're expanding labor supply on the extensive margin, so they're just working many more days of the year. And overall, total labor supply is going out, uh, and that's leading to this, this big increase in their earnings. And then it, we'll be talking about a lot of this other dimension, so I won't dwell on it. But if you look, for example, at you know, things that you use to compute um, poverty measures, like you see these big increases in <coughs> durables and expenditure of non-durables, 
cash savings. Most, most interesting, going back to the original question I was interested in 2006, you start to see diversification. So you've certainly seen an increase in the value of the, of the cow business, but you start to see a diversification towards other assets. So this is the value of land. Owned. So these women, obviously from an incredibly low base, are beginning to both buy and rent land. They're beginning to buy uh, more productive assets. So they're really diversifying their economic base. And I think, to me, that's the most convincing sort of demonstration that they are on a different trajectory out of poverty. And Oriana will get to that this afternoon. OK, so let me finish. Um, so the key findings are that poor women were, were unable, rather than unwilling or unfit, to engage in the same occupations of wealthier counterparts. The program relaxes the constraints, so we're very clear. So, you know, we're looking at an overall uh, program, which is bundles. Um, we're not, this is something we're going to get into today, what, what happens when you begin to unbundle it. But clearly the program relaxes the constraints that we're preventing them from doing so. Uh, there, and this in, indicates that their baseline labor allocation. So there's money being left on the table. If people with innate talents to do cowering were not doing it because they, they, they were constrained from doing so. And as we'll discuss during the course of the day, there is now evidence that this can be successfully implemented in a wide variety of contexts. So in fact, when you think about it, it's an incredibly simple idea. You look inside these villages, there's, very, there's a very limited set of occupations that women are engaged in, and you basically see whether or not you can move the very, very poorest women into the types of occupations that the, 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 the middle and rich are women do. And basically, the, the answer is you can. It is also interesting that, that at the, in 2007, they're given you know, a choice of a number of businesses they could uh, be involved in. And the overall, I can't remember the exact number, like 95% of the women choose to do livestock because this is the principal business that the wealthier women in the villages are doing. So it's something they understand, it carries social status. <coughs> Uh, and they, you know, they're more confident they can do that. Um, so I think I'll end there in the interest of time and pass over to uh, Imran. Thank you.